It was 1955 when schools were desegregated in Tulsa, Oklahoma. My mom was in 11th grade when she left her all-black high school, where her teachers had known her and her family for decades, to attend to an all-white high school, where teachers and her new classmates looked at her with a mixture of suspicion and curiosity. But my mom, always the joiner, became the first black student at her new school student council. One evening, after a student council conference, the group decided to go out and get burgers at a local burger joint. My mom rode with Suzanne. She didn't know Suzanne very well, but she was the only other girl on council. They pull up to the drive-in, they order their food through the intercom system, and then they wait in the car for it to arrive. A few minutes later, the car hop comes out with their food, and she saw my mom. When she saw her, but she didn't really look at her or acknowledge her. Instead, she spoke to Suzanne. She said, "You can eat, but we don't serve Negroes." There was a long and painful silence, and then Suzanne looked back at the car hop and she said, "Fine, we'll get our burgers somewhere else." She starts the car and they drive away. Fast forward many years later. Now my, I'm in 11th grade, and my mom and I run into Suzanne at the DMV. The two hadn't seen each other in decades. They embrace. They start reminiscing about their school days, and somehow the conversation about that evening at the burger joint comes up. My mom asks Suzanne this question that she's never asked her after all these years. She said, "Why did you refuse the food that night?" I'll never forget how Suzanne responded. She said, "You know, I had been watching you all day at the student council conference, and I had been thinking about just how brave you were. You were the only black person in the room. People weren't exactly friendly. And so I thought, if you could have the courage to come and be here with us, then I could have the courage to let you know how much I wanted you here." Now, I've been an equity and inclusion educator for over a decade, and I often think about my mom and Suzanne's story when I'm working with young people. I think there's something in it that can teach us all about how to stand up for racial justice, even when no one is watching. Yes, we have come a long way since the 1950s, and we still have a long, long way to go. In other words, we marched. Now what? Today, I'm going to offer you four challenges, four things that each of us can do to create a world that would make my mom and Suzanne proud. Number one, find your why. A couple of years ago, many of you marched to protest the deaths and to mourn the lives lost of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and so many other black souls. It was a moment that brought focus, energy, and a sense of urgency to a much-needed and long-overdue conversation about racial justice in America. And yet, what sustains us past that moment? Once the latest outrage in the news is over, and once the marchers have gone home, that is our why. Our internal motivation to do the hard work. This is true. Whether you are a white man from New Hampshire or a black woman from Oklahoma, without it, we can lose steam and get discouraged. Now, my mom's why was inherent. Her very survival depended on her deep belief that racial justice was and still is possible. Suzanne's why came from her budding friendship with my mom and her admiration of her resilience. My why, my why comes when I think about my nieces and my nephew and my students, and wanting them to seize every opportunity they can dream of. Maybe your why comes when you think about your own children, wanting them to grow up in a world that values diversity and that seeks it out. Or maybe, maybe it comes from your own recognition that we are all connected. And that our humanity is inextricably intertwined. What's your why? <laughs> Obviously, I can't answer that question for you, but I challenge you to think about it. 
Finding your why will help you see your path forward. Number two, get curious. Do you remember how in March of 2020, we all became experts in infectious disease? <laughs> like, we went from barely passing high school biology class to becoming almost convincing epidemiologists in just a couple of weeks. Well, I challenge us to apply that same curious zest to understanding how race and racism have affected our communities. One of the ways you can do this is with starting with something that I call a racial autobiography visualization. It's a tool that I sometimes use in my trainings, and I'll invite you to do it as well. So if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. I want you to think about your childhood neighborhood, where you grew up. What was it like? What did the people look like? Did they look like you? Where did people who look different from you live? Did you ever go to their neighborhoods to play or to visit? Did they ever come to yours? Why or why not? What messages did you learn about race while you were growing up? Now I want you to think about the neighborhood you live in right now and to ask yourself those same questions. You see, our racial autobiographies have a powerful impact on our understanding of racial justice right now. As you ask yourself these questions, what comes up for you? Leaning into that curiosity puts us in the right state of mind to think about how race has affected our communities. For example, did you know that 250 years ago, Portsmouth was a major slave trade port? In fact, nearly 200 enslaved Africans lived right here in this city. Maybe you've gone to the Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail or checked out some of the resources online. At my school, we are learning about Moses Uriah Hall, the first black student to attend Phillips Exeter Academy. And we've been having conversations with our students about what his attendance meant for the students and community then and what it means for the students and community now. What are you curious about? Number three, start small to do big things. Now, hear me out. We need to think big and systemically about racial justice. In fact, it is access to health care, it is education, it is the law. All of these things have significant racial disparities, and we need to change them. Changing them will make a significant impact, and it is our daily acts of courage that sustain it. Think about my mom and Suzanne, for example. In the 1950s, they were two teenage girls. They couldn't change the world, but they could change one thing. Who got their hard-earned burger money? So how do we start small? I've got some ideas. First, we can commit to having conversations about race and racial justice. Perhaps this is something that you do at work as part of a discussion group, but this is also something that you can do in your own homes, around your dinner table. And in our house, we like to trade responsibility for who chooses the book or article or podcast that we'll be discussing. It creates a sense of shared ownership. Something else you can do is you can contact your elected representatives, and you can let them know that it is important that our students learn real history, and not just the parts that are easily digestible. If you have money, use it. Use it to support the people and organizations who are already working toward racial justice, like Stop AAPI Hate and historically black colleges and universities. If you don't have money, then use your time and talent. Donate that to the people and organizations who are already working to support racial justice. If you are a graphic designer, donate your services. If you are an accountant, offer to do taxes. If you are a photographer, show up at an event and offer to take pictures. There are so many things 
that each of us can do to support racial justice efforts. We just have to have the courage to do them. Which leads me to number four, lean into the discomfort. So why don't we do some of these things? Well, I think it's because we're a little scared. None of us wants to say the wrong thing or make things worse or hurt someone. And so sometimes we just take a step back. We brush things off. We lose the opportunity to connect. And so I'll leave you with one last story. So I'm a runner, and I run a lot. I live in Exeter, New Hampshire, and there are not a lot of people who look like me there, so I'm pretty conspicuous. <laughs> Sometimes people will see me out in public, and they'll just assume that they know me. And they're right, like 25% of the time. <laughs> see, at one point, there were actually four black women who all lived in Exeter, all of us good friends, but only one of us ran. So one evening, we're all at, at dinner, and we're with a few other friends, and a white man comes up to our table and says to my friend, wait for it, hey, I see you running every morning. <laughs> so my friend immediately starts laughing because she only runs if something is chasing her, and she turns back to this guy, and she very politely says, sir, I assure you, you did not see me running this morning. But this guy is insistent. He has spotted his local celebrity runner in public, and he is going to say hello. They go back and forth a few times. My friend is getting really annoyed at this point, and eventually the guy gets up, and he goes back to his bar stool. And that's when I see our other friend quietly leave her seat at our table and go sit next to him. And you know what? They actually had a productive conversation. Our friend explained to him how this is more than a case of mistaken identity and that his insistent behavior actually contributed to the systemic invisibility and devaluation of black women. And I think he got it. No, I'm sure that was an uncomfortable conversation for both of them. But they took the opportunity to connect. You see, Doing racial justice work is rarely, if ever, comfortable. But it's getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. That, that is the practice to make progress.